The year was 2001. A group of Nintendo executives sat in an extravagant boardroom ornate with a cherry wood table, beautiful, expensive ornaments and flush carpeting. They had been debating feverishly for what felt like hours. The volume was steadily increasing and the participants were becoming more and more flustered. The tension was palpable and the stakes simply could not have been higher. Engineers were barking at programmers in Japanese and Chairman Atsushi Asada sat at the head of the table, knowing that the outcome of this meeting would likely decide the trajectory of his company. The future of Nintendo was placed solely in his hands. They simply could not afford to mess up. However, let's leave the boardroom behind for a moment, to paint a clearer picture of Nintendo's fortunes. While the name Nintendo was, and still is, synonymous to many with computer or video games, they were in an unhealthy financial state in 2001, and lagging behind in an industry that they were largely responsible for founding. The sales numbers in their home console systems had been on a steady decline since the original Nintendo Entertainment System, the system that had pioneered the entire market for home game computers, and their financial situation reached breaking point after the release of the beloved but ill-fated Nintendo GameCube. While many would beg to differ, there simply is no other way to put it. The GameCube was a financial failure. Compared to Microsoft and Sony's respective efforts in the home console industry, the Xbox and the PlayStation 2, the GameCube's sale figures were damning. Nintendo sold 22 million units, which may seem like a lot on the surface, but compared to Xbox's 24 million and the PlayStation 2's astronomical 150 million, the GameCube fell embarrassingly short. Slowly but surely, retailers would stop stocking GameCubes, often citing the soft demand for the new tech. It started with UK retailers Curry's PC World, then Argus jump chipped, and before long, even if someone wanted a GameCube, they would struggle to find somewhere stocking them. Major publishers like Acclaim pulled support, and Capcom, a major third-party publisher, made three of their five exclusively GameCube-developed titles available on other platforms. In fact, one of Nintendo's founders and lead producers, Mr. Shigeru Miyamoto, was quoted to say that they had already begun production on their next generation home console immediately back in 2001. A telling quote indeed for the state of the GameCube. Nintendo were to go back to the drawing board. They were just barely surviving thanks to their core fan base, but sadly, that was not enough. They needed new fans, they needed more people to market to. But you cannot just create a market out of thin air. Or can you? Blue Ocean Strategy is an extremely risky and audacious move for any company, and is seen by many as a shot in the dark, a Hail Mary do or die maneuver. The strategy, according to the University of Harvard, is a simultaneous pursuit of differentiation and low cost to open up a new market space and create new demand. It is about creating and capturing uncontested market space, thereby making the competition irrelevant. The name itself is a metaphor for what the strategy entails. Imagine in this case that Nintendo, Xbox and PlayStation are all fishermen. They all throw their unique kind of bait into this small exclusive pond day after day, all going after the same fish. Some nights, big fisherman Nintendo catches enough fish that he can afford to order a pizza. Other times, he ends the day empty-handed and has to resort to scrounging around for leftovers. In the year 2001, Nintendo isn't catching any fish anymore. All he can rely on are the few regular breeds that pass by day in, day out, but they are few and far between, and Nintendo, frankly, is going to die if things do not change. It likely isn't surprising, then, that pursuing the Blue Ocean strategy was one that Nintendo found compelling. To break away from the pond and try their hand in the deep blue ocean, a dangerous territory that certainly some will thrive in, but others will drown in. There are many more fish here, but there is the chance that these fish just don't care about your bait. If so, you left behind the certainty of the loyal fan base. Who knows if they'll take you back? Have they moved on? But, and this cannot be stressed enough, with careful planning, a reliable strategy, Lots and lots of research and a little bit of luck. Leaving the knuckleheads to lock horns at the pond while you conquer the ocean will elevate your brand to an unprecedented, impossibly high level. Your ceiling grows infinitely higher. Instead of potentially being king of the pond, you can be king of the whole damn world. But no conqueror ever conquered anything without a plan. 
and every plan starts with the seed that is an idea. In this particular scenario, this idea started with Thomas Quinn, a garage inventor and an aviation enthusiast. Quinn had a desire to modernise the control mechanisms inside of an airplane to promote accessibility, improve efficiency and dissolve the barrier to entry for aspiring pilots. Quinn slaved over this idea and came up with various different concepts before finally settling on what he referred to as the motion controller. Quinn, however, was only granted the patent in 1999, and by then aviation had evolved to such an extent that further refinements in the cockpit were deemed unnecessary. To his credit, rejection did not knock him, and Quinn decided to pursue motion control in an entirely different area, the computer game industry. Fast forward to 2001, and Thomas Quinn found himself standing in the corner of that Nintendo boardroom in the eye of the storm. He did not speak Japanese well enough to understand the nature of the debate, but intuition and an assistant told him that the executives were torn on the nature of his motion control patent. That very same patent had been turned down by both Microsoft and Sony, or more accurately was laughed out of their respective rooms. He had turned to Nintendo as a last desperate resort, and pitched them a truly ludicrous idea for the time. This was an idea that both of the giants of the industry rejected instantly, an idea so ridiculous that Nintendo, the kings of left field, the masters of innovation, a company endearing for its oddness, was still left torn in half. Atsushi Asada commanded silence in the room, and the cacophony of noise died down. The decision had been made. Asada agreed to buy shares in Quinn's company, and in return, was given license to the motion control patent. The idea of a motion controlled video game, as it happened, was just crazy enough to work. Soon thereafter, plans were put in place for the aptly codenamed Nintendo Revolution. Nintendo knew that the 80% stranglehold they had had on the market in the 80s and 90s was lost. Instead, they came up with a bold, audacious plan to create a brand new market out of thin air. This plan, of course, was the aforementioned Blue Ocean strategy. While Nintendo, Microsoft and Sony had been locking horns for decades competing for the same fish in the same pond, Nintendo wanted to leave that pond behind and attempt to potentially capture an unprecedented variety of fish in an unfamiliar daunting ocean filled with potential and danger in equal amounts. The plans and design principles for the revolution were new, exciting and, as it turned out, entirely genius. Nintendo buckled down from the off and worked out what their primary principles, goals and motivators were in regards to design. The GameCube was arguably the most powerful of the three home console competitors in regards to sheer horsepower, yet its failure was conclusive. This solidified to the executives that the arms race for graphical prowess was not one they believed worthwhile. Instead, they would design a last-gen console closer in internal structure to the GameCube instead of pushing forward. Miyamoto has spoken in retrospect about how Nintendo were not interested in a war of attrition in regards to graphical rendering capabilities. He claimed that it would be like having three ferocious dinosaurs who would just compete with each other and eventually wipe each other out, or, as he put it, accelerate each other's extinction. Instead, Nintendo would focus on innovation and trying to corner the untapped blue ocean with its hardware. There were worries, naturally, that the company might alienate their loyal core fanbase. This, of course, was undesirable, but somewhat par for the course. Nintendo, as evidenced, however, did not always follow the course. Think of a company's business strategy as a spider's web. In the centre, there is the core, most fundamental principle of all, the target audience. From there, this fundamental principle is built upon, with each preceding decision attached to and formed as a result of that core desire. At the centre of Nintendo's web, was appealing to the casual market with a slight caveat. As previously mentioned, they simply could not alienate their current core audience. It would have been very anti-consumer, frankly, to push away the loyal customers that have been supporting them despite their recent failures, and it would be bullish and unwise. Should Nintendo go all out in the casual market and should it fail, to not have at least their fan base to lean on would be catastrophic. It was going to be quite the balancing act. To lean too far in one direction would spell the end for one of the longest standing, most successful tech companies in history. 
Bearing these things in mind, Nintendo knuckle down and produce guidelines, or perhaps more accurately, a strict to be followed gospel to build a revolution around. Miyamoto, Satoru Iwata, and George Harrison and more have spoken about the laser type focus the Kyoto based company have when designing new hardware. When they have a goal, they go for it, no matter what, even if it is said to be impossible to achieve for the time in question. These guidelines would be key to swaying the casual market. They were price, size, power, accessibility, versatility, and compatibility. Back in the early 2000s, video games were quite the opposite of accessible. I mean, Look, what the fuck is this? They were completely unintuitive to those without some experience in computing or prior usage of video game hardware. What's more, many just did not see the point in even bothering to learn how due to the mass media condemnation of this new computer game technology. Back then, the idea of making a game system that was not only accessible, but to also make something that regular people wanted to invest time in seemed impossible. It was not a question of can we make an accessible game remote, but of how can we make something accessible and fun at the same time. Yes, someone could make a one button system suitable for grandma, but why should grandma care? Fun and accessibility in video games were a Venn diagram with no overlap. That, as it happened, was all about the change. Appealing to the grandparents and the parents of the world while not alienating the established fans was the primary goal, but it was becoming quite the conundrum. Game designers and hardware engineers were in conflict with each other. When the engineers had finally decided on a remote concept design to use with the revolution, game designers would be horrified. Many of the concept designs for remote controls were unorthodox and simply incompatible with the software that the designers had been labouring over. From one buttoned discs, a remote that resembled a Japanese fan called the Gunbai, these creations were exactly what they needed to capture the casual market, but would most certainly kill off any interest from more advanced users. Yes, they would be intuitive and utilize motion control, but to the detriment of any semblance of complexity. This balance was proving exceptionally hard to come by. Fittingly, it was company founder Miyamoto who eventually unearthed the winning formula. He brought a TV remote and a telephone along with some other similarly shaped remotes to a meeting with the executives and designers and said this was what they needed. Something familiar, something versatile and importantly capable of utilising the motion control technology. He believed that the key to keeping the balance between the blue ocean and the fans was an immersive accessible motion controller and the TV remote would be instantly recognisable, intuitive and infinitely versatile. The idea resonated with the hardware engineers and spurred on by Miyamoto's innovative ideas, a prototype was soon ready. The remote was a white rectangular shell resembling a TV remote with four directional inputs in the top, a large main A button just above the center and a prominent B button resembling a trigger at the back of the remote located directly opposite the A. The Wii remote is unfairly vilified. It is a uniquely genius creation that taught you how to use it, no manual or instructions needed. The remote was designed to be intuitive first and foremost. First of all, the remote was wireless. While this may seem like a minimum requirement these days, back then, this was a risky innovation. It was not the first wireless controller, but it was a pioneer in the field, and the first wireless controller to launch with the system as a day one pack-in, a remote that the system would be designed around. When navigating menus with this remote, the primary interact button was A. Think of A as the left click on a mouse. As such, A is the largest button in both area and volume on the remote and was a different color. The A button boasted a translucent gray tinted shell. This transmits instantly the importance and purpose of the button. Its location on the remote is also key, just above the center. This way, it is the most noticeable button on the remote and more importantly is a button that the user's thumb naturally rests on upon picking up the remote. Think also of the naming of the button, A. A is the first letter of the alphabet. A is synonymous with alpha or first or primary. Nintendo subliminally tells the consumer that A is the primary button without ever needing to explicitly say so. The importance of all this cannot be understated the remote needed to be instantly accessible and intuitive to the newest of users. 
As previously mentioned, the button opposite A was named B. B is situated directly behind A on the other side of the remote. In this way, when the consumer's thumb rests on A, their index finger rests naturally on B. Because of its shape as a curved trigger, it supports the index so that it rests on it without getting uncomfortable. This was important. To pursue an inexperienced audience required both comfort and an intuitive sense on how to operate it. Once again, the naming of B is excellent. It is not as important as A. In fact, one could feasibly never actually use the B button at all, as not all software utilized it and it was somewhat useless in navigation of the menu. But it is one of the two primary buttons on the remote in regards to software interaction and as such, it is named accordingly. It is in the same function group as A, so its name is derived from the same source, the alphabet. From there, there are the buttons 1 and 2 and plus and minus. Neither pair of buttons function as primary interactors, they hold lesser roles in regards to software. As such, neither are assigned names derived from the alphabet, but from two different sources. Plus and minus are both mathematical signs, signifying their difference from the rest of the functions, but also grouping the pair together, insinuating them having similar purposes. These buttons are small, showing that their purposes are not as primary interactors. They are in the centre, surrounding the home navigation button, cleverly illustrated as a house in the centre of the remote, and this signifies importance. As mathematical symbols, one would attribute a technicality or complexity to them upon seeing them, and their purpose reflects that. They are used to pause and to bring up and navigate settings. Another interesting facet of their design is the travel distance of plus and minus. As distinct from every other button on the remote bar power and home, both of which have a similar travel distance and a similar technical purpose, these buttons have a distinct click in contrast to the more nuanced push of A, B, 1 and 2. Because these functions are technical, important and unrelated to play, software or virtual control, there is no room for subtlety. Whereas a play button that one would push, A, B, 1 or 2, has room for a less defined nuance, jump a little, run a little, throw shorter, the user would rightfully feel frustrated if there was a subtle amount of pressure needed to pause or power off. You can't pause a little. That would more than likely cause frustration and broken TV screens. Oh. 1 and 2 are numbers, as distinct from letters or mathematical symbols, and reside in the bottom of the remote. The user knows that their functions are unrelated to the primary buttons A and B, but again are grouped in a pair together because of their similar function to one another. When the remote is held in portrait, or vertically, these buttons are far away from the fingers and are inaccessible without shifting the entire position of one's hand. This way, these buttons do not intrude on a first time user as they are seldom utilised when held in portrait mode. Their small size also reinforces their comparative unimportance. Even more so than B, someone could very feasibly, if not certainly, never use the 1 and 2 buttons. Their only function becomes clear when you rotate the remote horizontally. When rotated horizontally and held in two hands, the thumb of the left hand rests on the directional inputs, and the thumb of the right hand rests near the 1 and 2 buttons. When in this format, 1 and 2 become primary interaction buttons, signifying functions such as jump or run. This versatility was what designer Shigeru Miyamoto had in mind when designing the remote, to essentially house two remote configurations in one shell. The layout of the remote was pure genius. At a glance, the functions of the remote are clear, and the manner in which it is used is obvious. Even for those unacquainted with remote controls, the design is accessible, and the layout and naming scheme for each of the functions is nothing short of marvellous. In terms of accessibility only, and ignoring the fact that modern day designs are better in many other ways, contrast the Wii Remote to that of the controllers of the modern day, the Sony PlayStation Microsoft Xbox. Both have very unintuitive designs for beginners, especially in the case of Sony. Triangle Square X? What do these symbols mean? This isn't bad, in fact more traditional control styles are far more developer friendly. Even Nintendo's modern day remote, the Joy-Con, while a more versatile effort than their opponent's endeavours, is far from accessible. Looking at these images side by side, one can't help but appreciate how well Nintendo achieved their goal of accessibility, while not compromising on complexity. And to top it all off, the motion control worked perfectly. Because the remote was shaped like a wand or a rod, it was very easy and instantly intuitive to simulate a person, for example, hitting a ball, swinging a sword, or turning it like a steering wheel. 
what could possibly be more intuitive as a control method for, say, a game of virtual tennis than to pretend the remote is a racket? Just swing. You can see right here, I'm, I'm getting ready to serve. All I do is throw that ball up in the air. And when I, oh, jeez. And there goes the tennis racket. <laughs> The motion would also be used to create a computer mouse-like pointer with which you would navigate the various menus. It felt very natural to use and had next to no barrier to entry. In fact, it was arguably easier and more intuitive to use than what it was trying to emulate, the aforementioned computer mouse. Point at the TV. See the little hand? That hand is your hand. End of tutorial. Imagine for a moment that they had gone with one of their previous designs and that the motion controller ended up being a disc. This would not be versatile at all. It could perhaps simulate throwing a frisbee, but what about bats, swords, rackets, or a mouse pointer? Or what if it resembled a classic, more traditional computer game remote? Maybe the mouse pointer would work, but it would be very unintuitive compared to the rod, and unusable for any kind of motion simulation. One can very easily see how things could have gone so very, very wrong, and by looking at some of the Revolution's early prototypes, how it very nearly did. The design was rightfully a hit within Nintendo of Japan. Staff from Nintendo of America were flown out to test the new remote for the Revolution, and while they were initially sceptical, once they played a virtual game of tennis using the remote's motion capabilities, they were sold. As there always are, there were still some naysayers. Many bemoaned the lack of a rotating analogue thumbstick and feared it would limit the potential software development. However, a solution was soon offered up by the hardware department. A USB input at the bottom of the remote allowing various accessories to be plugged in. From here, the sky was the limit. The basic design of the remote had been decided, but now there were an infinite amount of button combinations that could be added onto the existing remote through the USB port. Analog sticks, traditional USB pants, this blew the door wide open. Now, the wildest accessories imaginable could actually be suitable. Think bongos, think Dance Dance Revolution, think USB microphones for singing games. These accessories actually existed and were essentially litmus tests for how people would respond to intuitive controllers, but in the past they would be cumbersome to find and awkward to set up in a living room. With the Revolution's remote being wireless and having a USB port of its own, instead of accessories being an extension of the system, they were simply an extension of the remote. A small difference on paper, but one that made all the difference in practicality. The analog problem was solved courtesy of an accessory nicknamed the Nunchuck because of its similarity in appearance to the martial arts weapon of the same name. The nickname just kinda stuck with it, so as it happened it eventually shipped as the Nunchuck. This remote was a microcosm of the mindset Nintendo had while designing the revolution. Easily accessible, infinitely customizable, only as complicated as you wanted it to be. Somewhat miraculously, they actually managed to stick the landing. They managed to create a remote that was intuitive and accessible to the casual market, and yet did not skimp on complexity by way of its extreme, unparalleled versatility. Nintendo had planned to make the revolution on par graphically with the GameCube, despite some initial rejection from within the company. However, Nintendo of Japan had many reasons outside of basic principle not to pursue newfangled high definition. The first of which was the fact that Satoru Iwata was worried about the suitability of what was essentially a high-powered computer running in the living room at all times. Nintendo wanted the revolution to be a family game hub and for it to be suitable and accessible for parents. As such, he was concerned that mums and dads would be put off because of the fire hazard associated with high-powered computers, and especially because of the loud, obnoxious fan. The revolution could not be taxing on the power supply, lest that defeat the entire purpose of its existence. Another sticking point was price. Miyamoto made the somewhat ridiculous demand that the revolution would retail at 100 US dollars. This was simply unrealistic, and eventually they decided on the still rather cheap 249. 
Miyamoto knew that their competitors, should they pursue high definition, would be charging close to $450, a price point far too steep for the casual uninvested market. Nintendo wanted the revolution to be a staple of every living room, not just that of the core fans, and the price needed to reflect that. The small size was another aspect Iwata assured was key. Iwata, when giving guideline parameters in regards to size, stacked a couple of DVD cases on top of each other and said, this big. The hardware engineers were surprised and taken aback, but accepted the challenge and surprisingly succeeded. In an effort to get the attention of the core, experienced crowd, Nintendo made the decision to make the revolution backwards compatible with Nintendo GameCube straight out of the box, by way of directly accepting GameCube discs via the disk drive. This meant that all GameCube discs could be played directly from the Wii without any modifications, waiting, or exceptions. In retrospect, this was a stroke of genius. As previously mentioned, not many people owned a Nintendo GameCube. Therefore, barely anyone had experienced the massive library of exclusive titles. The GameCube's library was beloved by fans and critics alike, dominating the Metacritic charts. However, the third-party support was minimal, and many didn't feel the investment was worthwhile just for exclusively Nintendo published software. However, the revolution was going to be substantially different from any of Sony or Microsoft's next efforts, and as such would be appealing anyway, despite the promise of Nintendo published software. There was a reason to own a revolution other than just being a Nintendo machine, and it having full, native backwards compatibility with a system that the vast majority skipped. For 95% of the world, the revolution would ship with a library of excellently reviewed titles right from launch, not even counting the promise of exclusive new titles in development. This was a bargain that would surely sucker in the crowds of core invested users. But what of Nintendo's loyal fans? GameCube compatibility would be useless to many of them. At the moment, Nintendo were prioritising the casuals, while semi-targeting those who skipped the GameCube. They did not need to invest too much into this native backwards compatibility. It was somewhat simple in execution, but was a powerful marketing tool. And yet, while it would be an excellent tool in marketing to the core video game enthusiasts, it would fall on deaf ears for Nintendo loyalists. To make sure they didn't alienate these fans, as previously mentioned, Miyamoto made sure to supervise the design of the remote and make sure it would be suitable for Nintendo's exclusive intellectual properties. Once the design was finalised and Miyamoto was happy in regards to its suitability, higher-ups at Nintendo made sure that Eiji Aonuma, a programmer and director held in very high esteem at Nintendo, had a high-quality project that would appease Nintendo's core fan base that could begin development. It was of utmost importance that it could launch with the revolution. By 2004, Nintendo were still finalising their designs and plans for the launch of their ambitious new system. Executives within the company, however, felt it was time to present what they were working on to the world. The company took to the stage at the Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3 for short, in June of 2004 to reveal codename Revolution to the public. There was no reveal of the hardware at the presentation, instead, President of Nintendo, Mr Iwata, President of Nintendo of America, Mr fils and the aforementioned founding father of Nintendo, Mr. Miyamoto, took to the stage to essentially hype the journalists and investors up by revealing some of their core principles and some of the software they had been working on. The definition of a new machine must be different, said Iwata, addressing the crowd. Nintendo is working on its next system, and that system will create a revolution. The time when horsepower alone made the difference is over. As a reveal event, Nintendo's reveal of the revolution was praised as being almost Apple-esque in terms of generating truly astronomical levels of intrigue. They managed to land each beat with grace, addressing their previous failures promising to do better, explaining their core principles but promising not to leave behind any core fans by way of revealing an exciting new exclusively developed video game for Nintendo's revolution, a follow-up in the beloved series of The Legend of Zelda. This was important, should Nintendo have neglected to reveal a more complex project, or one which could not have been considered casual pandering, it is questionable whether this reveal would have been a success in generating hype, intrigue and interest. To chase an entirely new market and seemingly neglect old fans of the company would instead have caused controversy and disappointment. Instead, Nintendo made clear that they would be pursuing a new market, but promised not to abandon the one they had already cultivated. So far, it had been smooth sailing for the company. 
Staff were not so much anticipating success as much as they were nervously hoping for it, but with the revolution, they had the license to dream. Higher ups were envisioning a spectacular return to form for the company. Inevitably, however, they had their first major hiccup early on in 2005. Nintendo of Japan contacted Nintendo of America to inform them that a name had finally been decided on for the revolution. The name was controversial as it turned out. Many higher ups in Nintendo's American division laughed at the name, calling it childish and strange. Regardless, Nintendo of Japan were certain that the new name would go down well with the public and decided to go ahead with it anyway. At the Tokyo Games Show in 2005, Nintendo finally fully revealed the revolution. Satoru Iwata took to the stage and proceeded to take the crowd entirely by storm. Iwata held up the new remote for the revolution and declared to the whole world watching what this revolution would be. We. Oui. We gave you DS. A new Game Boy. And new games to play on them. And now you say... You want a revolution? Well, we've got one. This is a Nintendo Revolution prototype we have with us for meetings this week in Los Angeles. Clearly, Revolution is by far the smallest console we've ever manufactured. Finally, I'd like to give you one full answer to a piece of the Revolution puzzle I have talked about previously, backward compatibility. As I said, the disk drive will accept GameCube games, but we are redefining the term backward compatibility. That's because we have designed Revolution to be a virtual console capable of downloading 20 years of Nintendo content. You will be able to purchase great games originally created for NES, Super NES, and Nintendo 64. It is accurate to say that Nintendo Revolution is technically capable of playing virtually every Nintendo console game ever created. The idea of a single device transporting us back to the first Excite Bike, Earthbound, or Punch Out should make us all feel young again. <laughs> At least for a while. Nintendo then released a press statement explaining the name. While there is not much to learn from the statement that one could not already figure out through intuition alone, it is nonetheless interesting. Introducing we, as in we. While the codename Revolution expressed our direction, we represents the answer. We will break down the wall that separates video game players from everybody else. We will put people more in touch with their games and each other. But you're probably asking, what does the name mean? We sounds like we, which emphasizes this console is for everyone. We can easily be remembered by people around the world, no matter what language they speak. No confusion, no need to abbreviate. Just we. We has a distinctive II spelling that symbolizes both the unique controllers and the image of people gathering to play, and we as a name and a console bring something revolutionary to the world of video games that sets it apart from the crowd. So that's we. But now Nintendo needs you, because it's not really about you or me, it's about we. And together, we will change everything. If one were to trawl through Metacritic listings and various fan polls, you would find that many of Nintendo's most popular, highest selling or most beloved titles released during the Nintendo Wii era. New entries in The Legend of Zelda, Various Super Mario entries and Super Smash Bros. were promised to the delight of many that year, before the Wii had even launched. This combination created a perfect storm for Nintendo. Wii was a place where families could play together. It was the only place to play motion control games such as Wii Sports and, what's more, 
it was going to have a massive library of both new and old Nintendo published games too. The value proposition was undeniably incredible. The pre-release strategy was carried out with perfection. Every facet of the newly named Wii was meticulously and surgically crafted to meet the goals and principles set in place at the beginning, whilst somewhat succeeding in being versatile enough to offer complexity. It was fitting then that Nintendo's efforts would pay off by creating an unprecedented stir in the media. However, what was so unique about the fuss being made of the Wii in the general media was that it was positive. There were no demonising stories of the Wii pre-release, no accusations of potentially inciting violence or causing obesity, but instead quite the opposite. Instead, journalists were reporting the unique, magical and groundbreaking innovation the Wii would have. Nintendo wants you to stay fit from the comfort of your home with Wii, or with the Wii, Grandma can play tennis with the family without leaving the house. The praise they received was unparalleled, praise that they themselves likely did not expect to receive to such a degree, but make a splash, they did. However, despite this pandering to the blue ocean, Nintendo's loyal fan base were mostly satisfied. They had a system with full backwards compatibility with the previous system, the only system with motion control, and a whole new library of Nintendo published games to look forward to. But it is very, very important to stress that an enormous chunk of Nintendo's overall Wii sales were casual players and families interested in Wii sports and the like. Yes, versatility, compatibility and the exclusively Nintendo titles drew in the Nintendo fanbase and other interested game console users that skipped the GameCube, but the Wii's astronomical success is solely attributed to the blue ocean market. And yes, Nintendo should be commended for not abandoning their core fanbase, but quite soon after launch, Nintendo realised that they were now in an unfortunate predicament. They had two audiences to cater to. The Wii was flying off shelves, positively printing money. I was a kid at the time and I remember my mind being positively blown away by Wii. Nintendo's perfect execution of the Blue Ocean strategy left them with boatloads of fish. They knew well that they had captured lightning in a bottle, a success they may never achieve again. They needed to cultivate the new fans they had created. They essentially had the world in the palm of their hands, but now they needed to retain it, and with every second wasted they risked letting their new audience slip through their fingers like sand in a strainer. Nintendo, due to the nature of the Wii's install base, had essentially torn itself in two. More than half of the audience of the Wii had invested in the system for wacky, motion control, super accessible experiences, and Nintendo needed to cater to them if they wanted to survive. They produced, published and licensed countless amounts of apps and games designed to appeal to this install base. At the same time, however, the Kyoto-based company were anxious to retain the Blue Ocean market into the future. They figured the best way to achieve this was by getting this new audience invested in their brand, characters and franchises. As such, many of their new projects began to prioritise accessibility over complex, deep mechanics. It was crucial that Nintendo sculpted this audience into a loyal fanbase that they could rely on, or else there would have been no point in capturing them in the first place. However, this created a conundrum for Nintendo. How could they successfully introduce people to their series while simultaneously keeping the already introduced satisfied? The solution they came to was to try and do both at the same time, casualifying many aspects of their long-running series. This worked exceptionally well in many cases, even improving the overall experience. These differences were not noticeable in others and negatively affected the experience in some. The success rate was constantly shifting and fan reaction was mixed. At launch and for some time afterwards, fans were predominantly satisfied with the casual core balance the Japanese company had found. Super Smash Bros. and Super Mario Galaxy made some necessary sacrifices to be enjoyed by the casual audience, but crucially, they did not do so to the detriment of the overall product. Mario Kart Wii was a perfect example of a casually skewed title done perfectly, and is for these reasons Nintendo's most important release in recent memory, and one of their most important releases in history. Seeing as the franchise is casually skewed in general, fans were not only not bothered, but excited for new gimmicks like the motion controlled steering. Gimmicks such as these sent the casual Wii audience into a frenzy and kept core fans engaged. 
The game shipped over 30 million units, and people absolutely loved it, declaring it a masterpiece despite or even because of its casual nature. To put it into perspective, it is the 7th best selling game in history, 8th if including each incarnation of Tetris under the one name. It sold amazingly and introduced tens of millions to Nintendo and the characters of Super Mario. Mario Kart Wii thrust the brand into the spotlight, bringing Super Mario to a level once exclusively occupied by Mickey Mouse. Nintendo are still reaping the benefits of its release to this very day, with the astronomical success of Mario Kart on the Nintendo Switch, which is selling remarkably despite it being a near exact version that was released on the Wii U. It can be said that, without a doubt, the brand of Nintendo and Super Mario would each not be so prominent today without the immeasurable boost Mario Kart Wii gave the company. One could argue that its success alone achieved Nintendo's goal of retaining and sculpting a new fanbase for its characters. The cherry on top for the tech giant was that the fans did not feel alienated or betrayed in the slightest. While this perfect balance of catering to both fans and newbies alike can certainly be attributed to the intrinsic nature of the franchise in question, they deserve to be commended for crafting and marketing this product so perfectly. However, it is only fair then that they should also be criticised for bungling that balance. As much as it seemed to investors, shareholders and fans alike that the big end could do no wrong, no business, regardless of form, can hit home run after home run without the occasional foul ball. For Nintendo, that foul ball was the horrific mishandling of the cult classic beloved ancient IP, Metroid. It is very feasible, should you be of a certain age, that you don't even know what Metroid is, or perhaps that you know of Metroid, but have not purchased or owned an entry in the near legendary series. The Metroid series is one of Nintendo's oldest, its first entry dating all the way back to the original NES. The franchise had a sequel title developed for the sequel system to the NES, the SNES, but after that, the series skipped the Nintendo 64, the first Nintendo system capable of rendering three-dimensional images, before making a triumphant return to form on Nintendo GameCube, with two entries titled Metroid Prime and Metroid Prime 2. Metroid had been on form in regards to critical reception, and while its financial figures were good, they were not stellar. No blame was attributed to the actual software, however, but was instead attributed to the low install base of the GameCube for its entries in the series. Not only were these titles some of the best reviewed games on the GameCube, but some of the best reviewed games of all time. As such, Nintendo and developer Retro Studios were chomping at the bit to publish the finale to the critically acclaimed trilogy. Metroid Prime 3 was released on the Wii and it was indeed critically acclaimed, but financially, it was confusingly disappointing. For the developmental time and effort poured into the title, the return on investment was extremely poor. The results were discouraging, and whether the financial return had an effect or not, Retro Studios were finished with Metroid. They went to go work on something new, and seemingly, so did Nintendo, who would later give a third-party studio the license to the series for one project subtitled The Other M, which would fail financially and critically. Why did a title so critically acclaimed as Metroid Prime 3, in a series so beloved by a studio world-renowned on a best-selling system, fail on the financial front in such a deflating manner. There were numerous reasons as it happened, completely and totally unrelated to three of the four aforementioned points and entirely to do with the latter, the system. Look at the install base of Wii. The majority of the audience are newbies interested in Wii Sports and Mario Kart, or people looking for some comparatively cheap fun. Metroid would certainly not be suitable for this crowd. One could argue that other 3D controlled games such as Super Mario were successful financially, which in theory would nullify the argument that it was too complex. Which, first of all, first person perspectives are less accessible than that of third person ones, but more importantly actually leads into the next point. Metroid is not suitable for kids and is not recognisable. While anything can be enjoyed by anyone, the spooky atmosphere and the hunting of alien monsters, while not graphic, could be deemed unsuitable by parents or not fun by kids. 
These two aspects alone considerably shrink the target audience, but it shrinks further still. One could argue that kids do like shooters, but there is a big difference between an established, recognisable name like Call of Duty with a gung-ho military guy in the cover in comparison to the slower-paced exploration shooter with a, crucially, unrecognisable character on the cover. Metroid is and was not really recognisable to anybody outside of the inner circle of die-hard fans, or fans of a certain age. The franchise was on the original two Nintendo systems of the 80s, but skipped Nintendo's first 3D system in the 90s, only returning in the early 2000s on their worst performing home system in history. In the midst of the 3D craze of the 90s, Metroid was nowhere to be seen. Fans of the series would have to have been alive in the 80s or early 90s, have owned the least popular of Nintendo's systems, or most importantly of all, fit into this bracket and have actually owned an entry in the series. That is quite a small pool of people to consider fans of the brand. One could argue that the genre had an impact on sales, however, while this has some merit, a lot of its reasoning requires a hefty amount of presumption and guesswork. Yes, one could argue that anyone interested in first-person action would stereotypically search for experiences matching this definition on other platforms. Nintendo are not renowned for this genre. This is valid, but one must also remember that the Wii was the cheapest available system at the time, and many bought it for this reason, meaning that arguments of the genre not suiting the platform are plausible, but not reliable. To add to the argument, the subtitle of this particular entry did it no favours, Prime 3, signifying the third instalment. This name it could certainly have deterred or intimidated people, a problem that potentially could have been avoided should the entry be titled differently, or if both prior entries were re-released for the at the time current system. It's evident now that the target audience for Metroid was far too small. Nowadays with the internet, word of hidden gems in the film or computer game industry, read far quicker than it used to. Parasite, a very hidden gem, won Best Picture at the Oscars. It is certainly feasible that if Metroid 3 were to be released today, it would have performed better financially, but the combination of the time, the audience, and the system that it was on doomed it to obscurity. To get back to the point, this showed Nintendo what happened when they skewed too far to the core side of the spectrum, and for fans it was depressingly sobering to accept what they had already known that there was more to sales than just making a good product. While one can never truly know what causes a shift in focus in a company, or if there even was a shift and it's not just a coincidence, Nintendo seemingly began to skew a lot closer to the casual side of their audience after Metroid Prime 3, all the way until the end of the Wii era. While at launch and soon after, casual Blue Ocean games were supplemented by deeper, core skewed titles, after Prime 3, the lines began to blur between the two. Nintendo presumably taken aback by Prime 3's sales and, being well aware that the future was fast approaching, began to focus on what is technically referred to as casualifying their established franchises with mixed success. Super Mario Bros. Wii, a 2D stripped down, easier version of the old Super Mario formula sold amazingly well, eclipsing the more innovative 3D entries. Despite the title being adored by many and praised by critics, Lots of fans despised it, feeling left behind by Nintendo. But Mario Wii was a critical and financial juggernaut, becoming one of the top selling titles on the entire system. This casualifying of established franchises continued. While many embraced this new direction, some fans grew increasingly disillusioned. And while I was just a young un, enamoured with the innovations of the Wii, far away from all the controversy, longtime fans had a right to be somewhat peeved. You'd be hard pressed to find a fan who does not admit that many of these were good business decisions for the time, but after a while, fans just began to feel betrayed. Nintendo had conquered the Blue Ocean, they were truly riding high, their strategy had been perfect. To return to the Blue Ocean metaphor, Big Fisherman Nintendo was notoriously good as a fisher from 2006 to 2010. He'd scatter his trademark bait and the fish would come in their hundreds, their thousands and their millions. He never had enough bait for all of them and was always seemingly out of stock. But this was fine, the demand was consistent and the profits were endless. His plan had worked. They were seemingly addicted to his trademark bait. The pond fish who followed Nintendo out to sea, once the only fish tended to, were drowning in an unfamiliar ocean, feeling neglected amongst the masses. One day in late 2010, Big Fisherman Nintendo would wake up to scatter his bait out in the sea and wait patiently to reel another fish in. 
and he would wait and wait and wait. None would come. Business was decidedly not booming. Off in the distance, Big Fisherman Nintendo saw Steve Jobs, of all people, had followed him into the ocean from the pond, sitting in his multi-million dollar kayak, throwing iPad and iPhone flavored bait into the water, and wouldn't you know it, the fish were going bananas for it. Nintendo frantically turned back to scan the horizon for any fish left for him to catch, and let out a sigh of relief. There were a couple left, all of them the loyal fish he had brought with him from the pond out of sentimentality. To his dismay, however, he realized that many of the fish he had brought from the pond were not around anymore and had left for greener pastures, or in this case, bluer oceans. He started scattering his new trademark bait out in the ocean and to his shock, the pond fish hated it and would not take it anymore. Suddenly, Nintendo was consumed by panic. The pond fish were growing sick of his wee flavored bait and the schools of blue ocean fish liked Steve Jobs' bait more. He sat back in his boat and sighed. The story of the Wii is soiled somewhat by its end. Sales began to decline dramatically and Nintendo rushed its younger sibling, Wii U, which was essentially just Wii 2, to market with unfortunate results. It is no coincidence that Nintendo's business began to stall in the 2010s. Nintendo were once the innovators, abandoning the meatheads cracking each other's skulls at the pond. They enjoyed years on their own in the ocean, but were soon followed by Apple in 2007 with the iPhone and in 2010 with the iPad, and in one fell swoop, had the rug pulled out from under them. That is the unfortunate risk of the Blue Ocean strategy. Sometimes, like in Apple's case, you take over, retain, and build an undying loyalty. Nintendo have had a tumultuous relationship with the Blue Ocean. They once conquered it with a perfect strategy, ruled over it uncontested. But then, for a period between 2011 and 2016, with the launch of Wii U, lost it and struggled to reclaim their throne. Stock prices and shares were at an all-time low. When you're swimming in deep waters, you're never truly safe. As unlikely as it may seem now, all it takes is for Apple to slip up ever so slightly like Nintendo once did, and then they will too plummet at risk of never surfacing again. It is a major major risk to get out of your comfort zone and attack the blue ocean. It made Apple. It revived and then nearly killed Nintendo. For example, Kodak came on the scene in the early 2000s with an iPhone-esque camera. It was innovative, it was advanced, it was the future. And you probably never heard of it. A few years later, Apple did it better and Kodak's camera, despite being innovative and impressive, was too far ahead of its time. Microsoft and Sony rushed to the motion control craze but implemented it poorly. Sony took the loss on the chin but Microsoft invested so heavily in their motion control knockoff Kinect that it very nearly sunk the Xbox brand and may end up having lasting consequences if they do not play their cards right in 2021. You cannot arrive at the scene too early or too late. Timing is key. Frustratingly, originality is not. You could turn up with an amazing idea like Wii U for example, expecting hundreds of thousands of fish but find a dried up canyon. Maybe nobody will care. And once you leave that original pond and betray the trust of the customers, you can seldom return. You are left at the mercy of the fans. Nintendo deviated from the regular gamble companies make of abandoning the pond. While this breaks and bends the metaphor even more than it already is being bent and broken. I mean, how can fish be loyal? Once you've baited them, you've reeled them in and they're dead, so how can you have regulars? Maybe the metaphor is better with pigeons, but then bread and pigeon in the park strategy doesn't have quite the same ring to it. Nintendo brought the fish from the pond with them to the ocean and catered specifically to them up until the very end. At that point, priorities began to shift somewhat and the fan base was split between those in favour and those disappointed. Blue Ocean strategy is difficult to pull off, harder to succeed with and kills companies all the time. Nintendo pulled it off with grace. They landed each beat with near perfection and if it weren't for Apple, they likely never would have dipped in popularity. Perhaps that fall was a blessing in disguise. They certainly came out of the fiasco wiser for it in 2017. 
It is a testament to their character, planning and their strategy that they managed to rule the world for so many years and despite being knocked down to their lowest point with the disastrous Wii U, got right back up again. One could argue that much of the Wii's success was down to luck and one cannot argue that luck may have played a part but it was no Hail Mary. People say that it was simply the right product at the right time or that it was a one in a million lightning in a bottle success. Neither of those statements are false but they do not cheapen the achievement either. You've heard, no doubt, the famous quote, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Selling 100 million plus units of anything cannot be attributed to fluke, but excellent market analysis and perfect pinpoint strategy. To say otherwise would be to discredit the achievement. But it is this achievement that only makes the failure of Wii U more confusing. How can one company go from meticulously designing a system to fit the hole in the market perfectly to throwing a Hail Mary seven years later? That, however, is a question to be answered another day. For now, reminisce on the achievement for successes as profound as the motion-induced frenzy of the revolution only happened once in a lifetime, with genius design and a sprinkling of luck. Nintendo conducted a perfect storm in the blue ocean.